Welcome to the We Shape podcast. We're coming to you from the We Shape headquarters. Uh, I am here in the next office. <laughs> Tyler and Nina are at the table. I have a cough, and so um, I feel good, but and I still wanted to do the podcast today because I was really excited about our guest, but I'm just coughing and it's just annoying. So um, I'm joining in the next room via video so that I can politely mute myself when I have an attack. So don't mind me if that <laughs> happens. Nina, Tyler, please take over whenever, whenever possible. We got you. We'll be plenty busy with questions, I'm sure of it. Okay. What do you guys, <laughs> how you guys doing in the next room? <laughs> we miss you. It's just, it's, it's like you're right there, but you're so far, you know? <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's hard it's to different, be apart. For sure. Feels like that third wheel is gone. So yeah, you know. it's hard to be away. We do a it's good hard, job with the third wheel thing. Um, <laughs> what are you guys up to this week? What's going on in your worlds? I well, you know oh. me. I need rest oh. right now. Our kids have been keeping us up and we went to the snow and it was amazing. But if you guys have ever done one of those trips where you're like, spend like a day or two prepping for like a day or two of a trip and then you come home and you need like another day of recovery That's not and a vacation. Like, what the heck was this i not mean it was vacation. so fun to see the kids in the snow but um on the flip side i'm tired yeah i well, need a break i celebrated my first wedding anniversary which is very exciting and then i made the smart plan with my february you know anniversary to go camping as our getaway yeah and it's gonna be like 30 degrees which i know is raining and i pouring. know it's colder a lot and you're of places, pregnant so and you're 20 complain. weeks pregnant but I'm like, let's go camping. It'll be so fun. We love to camp. And now I'm thinking that was not maybe my smartest idea <laughs> to like stay outside in the rainy cold weekend. That's like record breaking cold for us right now. So we'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> Have a great weekend. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be oh, fun. Man. We'll find a way to make it fun. We're going to pack a lot of layers. Lots of layers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how... That doesn't sound okay to me, like not pregnant and you're like halfway in your pregnancy. I'm like girl are you okay <laughs> i just i love camping and then i kind of forget about the physical limitations to some degree although i will say when you're pregnant you're very overheated all the time so hey maybe there i'll really help me out <laughs> there you go anyway um all right well nina you f you helped find this amazing guest this week so i feel like i'd love for you to uh read her bio and then we'll we'll bring her on and introduce her i'm i'm really excited about this so why don't you take the lead Absolutely. So for today, we have a wonderful guest named Natalie Rose Allen. She's a Toronto-based registered psychotherapist who specializes in treating eating disorders and disordered eating. She works primarily with adolescents and adults using a biopsychosocial approach to address emotion regulation, disordered eating, chronic dieting, negative body image and self-esteem, and eating disorders such as anorexia, bulimia, binge eating, and orthorexia. Natalie also provides intuitive eating and emotion coaching to individuals worldwide. Natalie is passionate about helping people build healthy relationships with their emotions and with their Thank bodies. Thank you so much for having me. We are me. very excited to have you here today, Natalie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for joining us, Natalie. That's you quite nailed a bio it. There. Yeah. You nailed that word. I practiced that word. <laughs> yeah. I did. I practiced it. I read it like bio yesterday. Biopsychosocial. <laughs> Thank you. So can we lead in with what that is? Yeah. Like, what what is biopsychosocial? The influences of our genetics and our environment and our relationships combine um, in this complex interplay to influence how we feel and how we um, approach situations and how we behave and in the context of today's topic, how eating disorders develop. And by knowing that complex interplay and yeah, by looking at a little bit of everything, oh, it also wow. helps with yeah. each individual person's treatment, like the best way to go about how to um, learn how to cope with what they're they're going through and approach recovery. Wow. Well, yeah. That's so, so great. I want to start, Nina, I know we were trying to ask this early, like we were curious ourselves. Do you want to ask her the question? What was the first one about the- Yeah. Well, one of my bigger questions I had for you, because it says here in your bio, you uh, specialize in treating eating disorders and disordered eating. And I'm so curious about what the difference is between mm. those two things. I, you know, have had friends who have had eating disorders, like clinical, like, and then I've been like, well, this, I feel like I'm yeah. having sort of, so like, what is the difference? And can you shed some light <laughs> on that It's kind of us? controversial, actually. Asking because, for a friend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes, actually, more recently, people will say, or people in my field will say that the lines are actually quite blurred, where disordered eating might actually just be, it's more so like eating disorders exist on a spectrum and maybe disordered eating is sort of less severe symptoms or um, 
more flexibility, whereas eating disorders are more rigid or, um, so it's sometimes you can look at it like that, like it exists on a spectrum. Other people will say that it's kind of the same thing. Like if you're experiencing disordered eating thoughts or behaviors, then you're struggling and, you know, you need some support there. So it's tricky that way. Um, another thing that is pretty common is for us to even view dieting as a form of disordered eating. So in that sense, there's a huge spectrum because, you know, most people have gone on some kind of diet in their life. So it's, it's, right. it's a difficult question to answer. Gosh. Yeah. Totally. Well, I don't even, yeah, I, I was going to say, yeah, a person. Who hasn't I, been on a diet I was going to say point. like, how does that work when our entire system is essentially in some ways disordered, right? Because I mean, I, we, Nina and I have talked about this on the show before where the first 10 years of our friendship were really the foundation of that friendship was like, what diet are we doing this month? Oh, they were crazy. And when, and when I look back, I'm like, we were really like, that was not healthy. <laughs> it wasn't a yeah. great dynamic. I'm glad we've shared yeah. that. Yeah. But it is it is complicated, it sounds like, these lines of especially – see, that's the other thing is like – Anytime I've ever had question in my own mind, like in the past when I've had rules and all the stuff around food, I have had that question like, is this even like healthy? Is this or is this disordered eating? And then instantly the cultural message pops in. Everyone does this diet. This is the way to do it. This is healthy. This is how your body will feel the best. And so like yeah. maybe talk to us a little bit I about think that kind the of the complexity of those blurred lines. Is that when it becomes an eating disorder. So first of all, I'll say that not everyone who diets develops an eating disorder. There's some kind of statistic where it's like 25% or 30% of chronic dieters do end up developing eating disorders. And so I guess the way you could yeah, the way the way you could tell it's an eating disorder is if wow, a person a is using dieting behaviors or obsessive dieting thoughts as a form of emotion regulation. So, you know, everyone can relate to that feeling of like you start a new diet, mm. you like start off with your healthy breakfast, you go into the office, someone comments on how healthy your lunch looks, like you're feeling good and in control, and then you get home and you're like, you know, starting to think more about food and you're hungry and you eat dinner and then you like, you know, you feel like having something sweet and then, you know, that still doesn't satisfy you. And then you have something else and then you end up having all the snacks in your pantry and feeling guilty. So there's a lot of emotions that are connected to your eating patterns there. You feel good when you're feeling like in control, you're, you're dieting or you're following those rules. And then you feel bad when you've broken those rules. So then the next day you might start again and feel good. So this becomes a pattern with for someone with an eating mm -hmm. disorder where it becomes very good versus bad. Um, the eating patterns and the thoughts around food become very rigid. And it's hard to break that rigidity on their own. And they may need a lot of support with that. And with normalizing their eating patterns again, and by breaking these strict rules against what's good and what's bad, what's healthy, what's not healthy. Um, so that's one way that I would sort of decipher it is like it starts to to regulate their emotions. So when also if they might be going through something stressful or experiencing negative emotions, they may turn to, they may be more likely to restrict or for some to overeat on food to manage those emotions. So I would say the rigidity and the emotion. Right. So it's the polarizing – it's like the polarizing nature of it is what I'm hearing you say, right? Like so when somebody – the more black and white we become, the more we get stuck in this like I'm doing good or I'm doing bad. And then that kind of feels itself yes, and we end up yes, like definitely. almost digging ourselves a deeper hole over and time. And the is that, fear is that of, of change or the fear of weight gain specifically becomes very intense and that might be accompanied by other behaviors like like excessive checking of the mm. scale or checking in the mirror. So we call those body checking behaviors um, where the attempts to maintain the same weight or a lower weight become extreme, where it starts to interfere with your normal daily functioning. Like you might not go out for lunch with colleagues or for dinner with friends because you're worried about the, eating the food there. Um, 
you might be experiencing all the effects of, of under eating, such as fatigue and mood swings and irritability and Sometimes binge eating is a natural consequence of food restriction, um, and yet still you're feeling really stuck in that pattern because it it feels like it's the right thing to do. And like, do people even know that they're in that? Like, does it become apparent when like your life starts getting like unmanageable? It'd like, what are the signs slope, that you're think. like? Yeah, like what are the signs Often that someone's like, I need to get help? That they're restricting, like that they're under eating because a lot of what diet culture tells us, there's like that gold standard of 1,200 calories is like the magic number for weight loss. So a lot of people have that nailed into their brains. Like I'll never be able to right. forget that number. And yet I know now that that is far, far below what most – like functioning adults um, and even adoles especially adolescents need. So um, yeah, to answer your question, sometimes it's caregivers, like uh, friends, family members who are really having to bring this to someone's attention um, because again, it's so normalized. So you see people talking about it. I would think that'd be hard because Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think it would be so hard because people reward people so often for weight mm. loss. Like there has been a time in my Truth. life personally where I was going through a really, really, really bad breakup and I probably lost like 25 pounds in a matter of a couple months. And people were like, you are killing it, girl. You look so good. Oh my God. And I was like, I'm crying every day and I'm eating like nothing. Like this is not a good time for me. But the reward from the outside was exceptional. Like I was shocked by how much attention I got during that time. From girlfriends, people, like everybody. Oh my what do you God, do? You look amazing. I'm like, point. I'm depressed. And that's, that's what's often happening. how these behaviors become reinforced, especially um, from a very young age, you know, just compliments on bodies or comments on bodies, period, be can become very intertwined with your identity. Like, especially if um, you're known as like the thin one or the athletic one in your family, that can become part of your identity and can contribute to this fear of changing, you know, who am I without that identity? If my body changes, people won't respect me or see me the same way. So that's uh, the positive reinforcement of dieting and weight loss and dieting behaviors um, is huge in like contributing to eating disorders as well. And, it's so interesting I mean, to me. Something I've heard you mention over and over again, you just keep using emotions, talking about emotions. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've been very aware of my emotions driving me different directions in my life. And I think that the biggest thing that helped me along the way was awareness, just being able to pause and say, oh, I'm experiencing this emotion. Where is it coming from? And, and be, being able to identify that and, and decide whether you want to act on it or whether you want to change that pattern or loop. So how does someone start becoming aware of the emotions that are arising prior to them making a decision around their nutrition or any other area of their life so that they can you know, Sometimes start to unwind some of these patterns that they might be stuck in? it's not even clear the way that emotions are influencing someone's behaviors. So often with people who develop eating disorders, they experience, they're highly sensitive. So they experience their emotions more intensely than perhaps the average person, or they've just never learned how to put words to their emotions. Emotions were just never talked about growing up. They don't have the vocabulary for it, let alone just the knowledge of how to regulate emotions. Um, and so sometimes it's – the emotions are happening in the background. It's kind of like you're going through your day and you're on autopilot. You're not even aware of how things are affecting you, of how um, you're feeling after a day of work or – or in a relationship, um, not setting boundaries with people and just sort of feeling like out of control in that sense. And you're, you, and you're focusing on dieting because that's something that we're told that, you know, we should be thinking of all the time and weight loss. So you, you start using that as a way to control how you're feeling without really knowing what emotions are coming up. So often when I'm working with clients, they'll say, well, you know, 
you're telling me to stop and think about how I'm feeling before I um, decide to like skip that meal or to overeat that thing. And, and like, I don't know what I'm feeling. I don't know how to, there's not one emotion. And so sometimes it's not about like, I'm feeling this way. And then I engage in this disordered eating behavior. It's like, an overwhelming feeling of disconnection from your emotions and your emotional needs. Like you're overworking, oh, you're um, skipping lunch breaks to keep working or to talk to colleagues, um, you're pushing yourself to the limit in school and you're like just experiencing this overdrive of stress because you're not meeting your emotional needs. You're not stepping back and saying, you know what? Like I actually am feeling tired and I need to rest or I'm feeling frustrated with that friend who like keeps asking me to help them with their homework. I need to set a boundary. That's not really happening. So it's about learning how to check in with yourself throughout the day, identify what it is you're feeling and what that emotion is communicating to you, what need uh, needs to be met. I absolutely love this because I remember sitting in a therapist's office um, a handful of years ago and her asking me, how do you feel about that? And I'm like, what do you mean? I don't know what you mean by that. And she's like, okay. And she slid this laminated sheet of feelings and definitions <laughs> across the table. And that was like my first introduction for somebody asking me how I felt and me being able to start to identify it. And I think it's just important to note that like, that's a lot of people's experience. They've never been talked to about it. They've never had the time to be aware of it. And I really appreciate you saying, you know, hey, a lot of people are unaware of this. And so it's it's about checking in throughout the day and starting to understand these sensations that are happening in your body and how they're influencing your actions. Um, I have a, a follow-up question to that is like, we live in this world that is um, just dopamine centric. We're just like seeking, 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 seeking constantly, right? And so when people feel these emotions arise and maybe they can or can't identify them, it's this desire to um, escape any of those feelings that tends to bring us away from ourselves, like you're saying, and just doing the things that we think we're supposed to be doing. Like, what are the, what are the beginning steps to unwinding that? Other I think than, it's you know, about starting to, check starting in with to notice the day? which behaviors are, are getting out of control and starting to have a more harmful impact. So if that dopamine is driving someone, I will say something interesting about dopamine. Mm -hmm. Um, it's been shown that for those with anorexia or restrictive eating patterns, they experience a higher dopamine from eating less. So going long periods of food actually results in higher dopamine. So that feels rewarding to them. So when you um, tell someone to with anorexia to just eat, that's wow. one of the things that's um, getting in the way is that, well, actually my body is signaling to me that it feels better when I eat less. And on the other hand, someone who is struggling with binge eating, they experience a greater dopamine rush from eating food. So as they're eating more than their body is, can handle in that moment, or they're eating past the point of fullness or eating more than they really need to, their brain is telling them something different, like, this is good, keep eating. So it's good to understand that's the bio part of the biopsychosocial um, wow. aspect of eating disorders is, is that how dopamine and how our biology plays a role in disordered eating too. But I think with, yeah. that's okay. I want to you touch on, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Fin finish what you're saying, Natalie. Um, I was just curious because can you give us some data around uh, the impacts of disordered eating or eating disorders for male and female. My hunch is going to be it's a lot more female. And if if you I can share with us why you think that is, actually the statistics are probably inaccurate. I think that eating disorders and disordered eating often goes missed in males because there's a greater acceptance over gym culture and diet culture in males, like m many males are engaging in the same kinds of disorder eating behaviors mm. um, as women. It's just that women tend to, you could say that women tend to experience greater pressures for their body image. I mean, that's for sure. So it, it's, it's, it comes, it's more acknowledged when a woman is struggling with their body image and disordered eating behaviors 
Whereas males experience, like they struggle with disordered eating as well. It's just they don't always acknowledge it or, or come forward. I mean, I've had cl- client male clients who come in and say, um, you know, I'm really struggling with depression and I'm just, I'm feeling like uh, really depressed and I need to work on my depression. And then we go into eating and sleep and exercise behaviors and it's like, well, they're fasting the whole day and then binge eating at night to make up for the fasting during the day and then feeling like they just don't have any self-control over their eating patterns and feeling depressed around that and isolating themselves from friends because that's a consequence of not eating enough and feeling tired. And so what they really have is the consequences of an eating disorder, which depressive symptoms can be a symptom of an eating disorder. So yeah, I don't have... You could mask it. I mean, I think what's most interesting about that is just that it sounds like um, we would think that women would have maybe much higher rates and what's maybe going on is that there's just an underreporting or under acknowledgement. I think that's part of, of it. And again, you're right. There are greater statistics of eating disorders occurring for women. I'm not sure if there's an underlying genetic approach to that or if it's more so um, a social social effects of, of diet culture and sort of the um, the thin ideal that women face so much pressures to be, to be thin and to maintain a certain body weight and that their value and worth is, is assigned to, to their body weight. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that I'm happy you did because, you know, I've st- struggled with binge eating my whole entire life, but you know, when I was a kid, it was uh, oh, he's got a good appetite. You know, and I think that there's, I I think there's a definitely like a gender discrepancy here where women are not ever encouraged to eat more. They're not encouraged to grow like the same way that, you know, we, we encourage our, our little boys and young men to do so. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely interesting to hear that, you know, there's a good chance that men have as much eating disorder. They're just, nobody's talking about it because it's more accepted in society and it's more accepted overall. So I I just want to say thank you for sharing that because it's something that, I know I've always struggled with, and it's been interesting. I've struggled with it um, when it was related to my weight and I was just eating junk foods. And then I struggled with it in the opposite way when I was just trying to do everything perfectly. You know what I mean? And then it bounced back and forth. And, that, you know, it takes a long time to find that uh, space of just saying, what does my body feel good eating? And what do I want to do right now that makes my body feel good? You know, so it's a big difference there. Absolutely. I have a curiosity for you. You have a really wonderful online social media presence. Um, I love looking through your posts and everything that you put up out there. And like, there's such a connection, I think, in diet culture between what we're seeing on social media, which is being fed to us, right? This mm-hmm. algorithm learns what we like and what we don't like. And, and it gives us more and more and more of that same exact thing. And I have curiosity, like, you know, that's a space that really is a super diet culture heavy space. And you operate from a different perspective, of course. And like, how do you feel like, you know, like you're getting traction, like you have quite a few followers and you have really positive interactions with the, the people who are commenting on your page and stuff. But like, do you think that the tides can sway, like sway? Like, do you think this can change? 100%. Do you think that social media Actually, can be a part of the Actually, I'll share a bit of my culture? personal mm-hmm. experience. I know that I was definitely like in 2015 to 2017 was highly influenced by wellness culture. So the whole gluten-free, dairy-free, refined sugar-free obsession, you know, really, really impacted me. And I started to eat too healthy. (laughs) Um, I mean, to me, I don't even call that health. I don't view that as healthy anymore. But at the time, that's what I was being shown was this is the healthy way to eat. Um, These are all the foods that are bad for you. And these are all the foods that are good for you. So it definitely influenced my relationship with food. And a couple years after that, I started following more, I don't even know how I uh, stumbled across an account, probably started with one account and then I started following them. Um, But basically the anti-diet community where uh, there's dietitians who are promoting a non-diet approach and intuitive eating approach where they started demystifying all these 
rules around food or these myths around food and saying, actually, this really isn't that bad for you. And this is incorrect. And this claim about food is incorrect. And so they were proving, they were breaking those food rules for me. And that really, really helped me. And I started challenging myself more to incorporating all the foods that I had been restricting from my diet and feeling great about it and and really proving myself wrong or facing those fears and realizing that those foods can be included in a balanced diet. And I feel better not having that stress around what to eat all the time and just being able to intuitively listen to my body. So so it worked in, in both ways. Um, it really depends on who you're following. And once you recognize or you sort of buy into the non-diet approach and you start following more of other clinicians or influencers who follow that approach and unfollowing accounts that promote dieting and, and this hyper-focus on weight loss, and you start to, you can actually, I think, really improve your relationship with food, at least in my experience. So I'm glad to that I'm hopefully one of those accounts for other people as well. Thank you. Absolutely. I definitely love what you're putting out there. <laughs> How does, like, I, I can relate to you, Natalie, with the, like, too much health food, right? Like the neuroses around like gluten-free and dairy-free and all the rest- – and this is bad and this is good. And then what is what does the middle look like, right? Like are, are we saying that we can acknowledge that nutrients matter for the human experience and for like having a body? Like nutrients matter sure. but the it's, approach it's is what is really important. It's just about getting out of that all or nothing mindset. So – A lot of people are afraid of the non-diet approach or intuitive eating approach because it sort of seems like, okay, that's the opposite then of healthy. Now we're just throwing all the nutrition out the window, don't care about health, but that's not what it is at all. It's a gentle approach to nutrition where if you want to go out for pizza with your friends, you haven't done anything wrong. There's more to food than just nutrition and fuel. Like there are cultural experiences and emotional experiences tied to eating where hanging out with your friends over pizza is a lot healthier than staying home and isolating yourself because you're afraid of pizza. So I think intuitive eating. (laughs) But what about, what about the practice of like, what about the practice? What about the practice of when, okay, well, I'm going to bring my own food. So I'll still participate in the social thing, but I want to eat really healthy and I, I care would, about the nutrients that go in my body. So I'm going to bring my own food. It it could be. Is like that if like a form of disordered thinking afraid around that food? not eating what they're bringing, that eating what everyone else is eating is going to cause imminent harm to their body. That is, that is a disordered eating thought. You know, if I eat this donut, I'm unhealthy or I'm going to gain 10 pounds. That's just simply not true. Our bodies are equipped with uh, powerful mechanisms that can digest food, metabolize different ingredients that maybe we don't eat every day, but we can digest it. It's, there's no harm being caused in our body. Um, health is determined, you know, a lot of people, diet culture tells us that health is determined just by health and weight are intertwined and that they're determined just by what we eat and and how we exercise. But there are a lot of greater determinants of health. So nutrition and health promoting behaviors like physical activity do play an important role, but we're, our health is more greatly impacted by stress, by socioeconomic status, by access to resources and health supports. So nutrition really plays, you know, a smaller role in the grand scheme of things. So if someone is really worried that their health is going to be affected by going out to dinner with friends, and I would say, let's challenge that. Let's see what happens when you, when you don't bring your food or is bringing your food a safety behavior. And like, I think I want to touch on, cause you know, Tyler and I, 
have been in the the fitness space for many years now. And um, I think one of the common threads that I'm still trying to unravel and understand is when, like Tyler, like when we go to an event and somebody's like, look at this new research I found on fasting. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting research. So it's like, then you have people who are then throwing the research at you and then you're like, oh no, like should I be doing that because that looks like that contributes to longevity or it's like how do you in an age of information that can basically tell you anything that you want to hear it's, it's really, like really how tough. do you navigate and I receive those that all waters. the time too if i'm talking about how intermittent fasting is something that can contribute to disordered eating and eating disorders someone will throw the research at me and say well educate yourself and i will say I understand that there's a lot of research out there. You can probably find research supporting any diet that it's, you know, that it will cause weight loss or um, it will cause um, you to feel good in the moment. I know with uh, with intermittent fasting, I think it's – what is the research saying that there's higher energy levels or it improves your – I don't know. I don't know exactly what the research says anymore, but. Tyler knows this one. What I was like, Tyler, looking at Tyler, Tyler what, you what is. At me. <laughs> no, I mean, to me, when I look at fasting, I think that um, it's a natural part of, of human evolution to have periods of time where you're not consuming food. And it's a great opportunity to, um, you know, instigate those mechanisms within the body that can do a cleaning of house within your cells. So the apoptosis and autophagy that happens after anywhere between 36 to 48 hours typically can help somebody's body. Um, I, I think in a, in a myriad of ways, but again, I just think of it as like taking out the trash. Right. But, but the thing I hear you saying a lot is, is, is not so much like fasting or this diet or that diet. It's like, what's the intention underneath it. Right. And we talk about that a lot within we shape because so many people have these, um, you know, lousy intentions. They come in, I want to lose weight because I feel insecure because nobody ever, you know, hugged me when I was young. If you just keep de digging deeper, it's usually coming down to some sort of pattern that we've developed when we were younger. So, I mean, is that kind of how you're seeing that this when somebody comes in with any particular thing, are you examining to see like, what's the intention behind this? Is this something that yeah, you're but doing I want to challenge that a little bit, Tyler. Not? I want to challenge it a little bit because they've actually been talking about how intermittent fasting for women specifically is not healthy because the fasting linked to their cycles can actually cause harm to them. And so that's correct. Issues, during, yeah. during, their, yeah. during their menstrual cycles, that's absolutely a horrible idea. You don't want to put stress on stress. Right, you want to be able to just have your body. You yeah, know, have so some there is a difference sense of in peace, how right? fasting the the impacts day. women versus men. And I'm glad that that research is starting to come out as well, and to lead women away from that. Um, I will say yes to Tyler that the intention behind our eating choices, our food and exercise choices, really, really matters. The thing that's tricky is that you just don't know if if you are going to develop an eating disorder or disordered eating from trying any of these diets that do that are backed by research. So someone with an eating disorder going longer, like three, like longer than three to five hours of yeah. eating of three to five, going longer than three to five hours without eating is enough to trigger an eating disorder cycle. It, it's almost like having a switch being flicked on in your brain that, mm. um, creates these obsessive thoughts around food or an urge to go even longer without eating or an urge to overeat. Um, so, and you just can't predict that by looking at someone. You never know whether someone's going to develop an eating disorder. Another thing is, is the, the individuals being used in the research, the individuals being tested are not you. So I always encourage people to say that, yes, this has worked. Maybe this has worked or shown short-term or long-term positive consequences for them. But if you're experiencing intrusive thoughts about food as you're fasting, or you are binging as a result, if you are noticing changes in your mood, any of the negative consequences, then those are valid. That is your body saying, this is not working for me. And every individual is just so complex. And we just can't say that one diet will work for everyone. I 
I mean, I used to do the intermittent fasting pretty regularly. Like, and I wouldn't eat till noon. Like, I would just have a cup of coffee. And it wasn't until I was like, I don't know how many years I did that. I still have to kind of force feed myself breakfast a little bit because my my body, I think, adapted to not eating in the morning. But then I was like, is this even healthy for my body to not eat in the morning? And I started realizing like, oh, when I do that, I feel so much better. But I think what happens, well, for me anyway, is I would get a piece of data in my mind. And then I would attach and marry myself to that data. And then I would allow my mind to drive the decisions of my body, even though my body was giving me different messages, right? Mm. And I think that the thing we have to remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, Natalie, but like (laughs) data always changes, right? They used to tell us that cigarettes were healthy for you. So like, I think that part of the issue, especially in like wellness culture, and especially like us being in the fitness and health space, like we have tried for so long to, you know, for years, people are like, oh, we need nutrition part of your product. And I'm like, I, I don't want to give that to you because I'm not going to tell you, you know, I, at least not anymore. We used to say, oh, keto and all this stuff, even though I felt like dying when I was on keto. Um, <laughs> it, it was like, it, I couldn't even do it for like a week. Um, but it's like, I'm not going to prescribe a plan for you. Like, I, that is not emotionally healthy for me to do that. There's, 8 billion different bodies in the world and like not a cluster of them are going to like all need the same thing. Like in a way, I would argue everybody needs something completely different. So it's actually not my job to be giving any sort of nutrition plan to anybody. And I think it's my job at WeShape is to actually dissect why we believe we need that in the first place and understand that like there's so many reasons and emotional triggers that drive those behaviors around food. And for me, it was all around like when I heard a piece of data I would like get it burned in my mind and then I would act out of that even though my body would be telling me something different. And I think it's important to just remember that, that like, again, the science is always changing. I made myself buy a book. Remember how, I don't know, Nina, if you remember no, Alex I, Light's I book. Have you ever Alex read Light that book, Natalie? You are her, not a before photo by Instagram, Alex Light. I haven't read the book, no. Yeah. It's yeah. A great book. She has a really good book. And in the book, she encouraged, there was this one book she said, it's called Food is Not Medicine. And I was instantly triggered. And I went, <laughs> uh oh, that means you have to buy that book because you're attaching yourself to this wellness yeah. community and to this belief system that healthy looks like this. Even though there could be exactly. data, it's like whatever we seek to attach to, we just look for that research even further right? It's like we instantly close the door. And it's kind of like what you were saying before about the child that grows up in a family where they have the athletic body type or they're, they they have been attached to an identity. And I think that that is the hardest thing is like the moment we attach to this is the way I live my life. These are the things that I do to quote unquote stay healthy Absolutely. is the minute we close the it's opportunity that, that our body might bias. need something else. Once we have bought into a certain belief about food, our brain naturally looks for the evidence to support that belief. And that's how Instagram works as well, like the algorithm, you know, we're just constantly buying into the belief of wellness and this is the right way to do things. And we're ignoring (laughs) the information that goes against that or the information that's coming from our bodies that contradicts that. I think there's even a a really deep piece if I, and I'm speaking for myself because this is my experience, but there's a part of me that thinks about health as like this thing I should always be working towards, right? And health is something that some people are lucky to have. Some people are, you know, they don't, they're born with different levels of health, right? Not everybody comes in with the same amount of points in that area. Um, And I think that in my head, I'm like, if I eat just right, or I get enough nutrition, or I sleep enough or drink enough water, like I'll live longer. And I really want to stay alive because I want to be here and be with people I care about. And there's that desire to, you know, and for me, I'll just call it fear, right? I don't, I'm not ready to go, right? I want to be here for a long time. And um, if I eat perfectly or if I work out just right or whatever, that like that will be elongated for me. And there's that, that humanness there, like we're fallible creatures and, you know, um, we actually don't have to do it perfectly and nobody gets out of here alive anyway, you know, <laughs> like maybe you should just have the, the cake or the donut or enjoy time with your friends, like you're saying. So, but there's fear attached to it. Like there's if I get this wrong. I deeply yeah. relate to the fear of like, if I don't follow these rules that are driven by data, I won't live as long. And 
I could increase my chances of longevity yeah. by doing A, B, and C. I still live in and some it'll of be that. My fault. Isn't that just isn't that all just a disconnection from self though? Isn't that like the the problem with our society right now? Is they say do this and do that, and the science says this and the science says that, and then we all show up and we're like listening to it, and we just ignore our bodies. We yeah. ignore those messages because it sounds like a lot of what I hear you um, kind of loosely repeating is how do we get people to be more mindful? How do we get people to be more self-aware and more connected to what their bodies are telling them so that they're making decisions from that place rather than the societal influences or biological influences? <laughs> or what was the third one? I almost got it. Biopsychosocial. <laughs> Psychological influences as well. Is that kind of exactly. like a lot of your work is yeah, just bringing back to that mindfulness? It's how our environment, how our genetics and how our um, emotions really impact our choices. I mean, we also live in a society that is driven by shame. Like we are constantly told what is wrong with us, what could be wrong with us and how to fix it. And that's where a lot of it, a lot of this comes from as well. Um, and we're disconnected from uncertainty. We're afraid of uncertainty. Whereas Uncertainty is just a huge part of life. There, there's no, there is no black and white. There, it's all gray. There are positive qualities about a food and negative qualities. So sometimes when we talk about good and bad foods, we talk about sure it would be unhealthy if you were only eating pizza or only eating donuts, and it would also be unhealthy if you were only eating kale or only eating carrots. So you can't look at things on that as black and white. There's a spectrum of this food has positive and negative qualities, just like most things in our life. And we have to kind of acknowledge what's going to be helpful for us and what's not going to be helpful. And I want to, I want to ask a question because I've struggled with, you know, I have two girls. I have a five-year-old and a nine-year-old, and I do value being able to offer them nutrition, right? And of course, they don't always want that. And so like, can you help? Because I really believe that part of the way we can change these cycles is through parenting, right? So if you have children modeling behaviors around, uh, you know, healthy relationship to self and food. Um, but can you put some language around communication maybe for all the parents out there who might be listening when it comes time to talk about food? So, and I would love for you to critique me because I'd love for you to pick this apart. I'm available for it. So like I, I've been trying to tell, cause we used to like be gluten-free. My daughter had Lyme disease. The doctor was like, that is contributing to inflammation. And then I noticed that my daughter was sneaking the food. And then I was like, whoa, these are the early signs of disordered eating no more gluten restriction. We're moving on. I'll take the physical implications over the emotional ones. Um, and so then I really, when that, when I went through that, I was like, whoa, you need to be careful because you're so fixated on eating the right things that like you now might be passing this on to your kids. So I started being way more loose in, in my food. And I would like be like, oh, we're going to go get donuts this morning. And they're like, what? Like I could <laughs> see that they were like shocked. And um, I just tried not to make a big deal out of it anymore. But the the lang I'm I'm str still struggling with the language because I do value more. Like I'm I'm totally here for the donuts and the pizza, but I also want to cook and provide nutrient dense options as well because I do notice a difference in their behavior and some of their um, physical symptoms when I'm only you know when I'm when when I'm neglecting those parts. So. Often, what I say, especially because I've heard people say, "Oh, just put the dessert and the." Um, just put like a sweet thing with the meal and don't make a big deal out of it. And I haven't been able to do that yet. And maybe we could experiment. But what I've been saying is I really want your body to have a little bit of nutrition before we have fun food. I think and so I don't know if that's the right language, but like I'd love your input on that. you were to your daughter and what she was experiencing around those restrictions and then easing up. I think that's amazing. I think kids really just need to be seen and heard and – acknowledged and just that support right there is amazing. I think, you know, parents are often scared about what they're doing wrong and if they're going to damage their kid's relationship with food. And there's just, there's no right way of doing it. But I think um, calling foods like, you know, these are less nutrient dense, these are more, um, these are fun foods, just removing like the good and bad labels or 
that they're being so good for eating their vegetables and being bad for eating fun foods. Like we just want to take away the morality and any shame around eating. I think that that is one approach of including the foods all together so that there's just more neutrality around these foods. Like this one is for flavor. This one is for fiber. This one is for protein. Um, maybe talking about the qualities that way and just, yeah, eliminating like any language around this being bad or this not being good for you or this causing weight gain, um, just anything like that. You know, a follow up to that that I find really interesting, and this could be applicable for children and adults, is um, I think oftentimes when people approach things in more of like an anti diet way, there's a natural swing from one side to the other, right? And it's like, I can eat whatever I want. And they just kind of start eating the things that they want and whatnot. And what's difficult about children is they're they're operating so much more out of that biological, that instinctual way, right? And so with such a high degree of palatability in our foods these days, um, you know, our children, at least, they want to go towards the foods that are, you know, empty in nutrition that we would traditionally say like, oh, these aren't as healthy, right? But mm -hmm. they're like, this is what, you know, our kids are great. They go, they go, it's my body, my <laughs> choice. And we go, okay, how do we navigate this one right here? But how do, how do, how do you like identify the difference between, um, you know, someone listening, listening to their body, I'm doing air quotes here. Um, and it, it's saying, give me the sugar because of this biological urge to eat this sugar, right? Because it's calorie dense and sweet and delicious versus, um, them listening to the different signal, which says after I ate that sugar, how did I feel? And then starting to build those patterns of discernment so we can make better yeah, choices. Yeah, it is really difficult with children that, like, because um, quick you're right. They haven't sense. learned to regulate their emotions yet. And, regulating hunger is is no different than that and learning of what choices are going to help them feel better going to help them feel stronger i think it's it's just there's no right way of doing it and it's really just it's just focusing on not inserting shame or not inserting guilt so you know if your child has eaten a lot of candy and, and they didn't want the food that was more nutritious and they had a sugar crash, like maybe commenting on, oh, like you seem re really tired now after, you know, a lot of candy that can happen after eating a lot of candy without any protein, you know, just sort of like be neutral, neutral. These are facts. It's not um, like we're trying to say that, like, again, that eating donut, only donuts is healthy or good for you. We're just trying to say that only viewing foods as good and bad is not great and that it's it's okay to incorporate a balance of foods. So let's have some of this food and have the fun foods as well. Have what you need and what you want. How about for adults? How do you get them to understand the difference between that biological <laughs> craving that's built around that like reward mechanism and for adults, like, it's listening usually to your about body, helping about them really recognize that these cravings, these intense cravings, are coming from under eating. So, because of diet culture, we've all really been taught to move more and eat mm. less. So, most of us are eating a lot less than what we need. We're cutting out major food groups because we were told that carbohydrates are bad, or maybe it was a fat-free diet. So we're so if as an adult you're having intense cravings, there's usually some kind of energy deprivation happening there, or a mental restriction. Like I shouldn't eat chocolate. You know, have you ever noticed that if you're telling yourself that you shouldn't be eating something, you're actually like eating more of it, and telling yourself I'll just be better tomorrow. You know, when you actually – a major thing Absolutely. clicked for me when I was like, I'm going to enjoy this and I'm slowing down and I'm eating it and I'm enjoying it. And then I like noticed that sort of shift where like, okay, it started tasting too sweet or it started tasting too salty and that was like my taste buds saying like, oh, you've actually reached enough of like the sugar and salt. And sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes we overeat and that's also normal. Like it just happens sometimes. Um, so it's really just. 
You know, what's so interesting is I, once I stopped doing the intermittent fasting, stopped subscribing to a diet that I should be on, stopped playing by rules and just said, okay, eat foods that seem like fun and eat foods that have nutrition. And I just started doing that. I didn't even make the connection to now, but like, I don't really have any cravings anymore. Like I'll have a little one and I'll- Same thing. And then the craving's gone. Yeah. Like I'll have a little one where I'll be like, oh, that sounds good. And then I'll have it. But it's not with the intensity and the vigor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not this whole thing. It's like the times that I felt like I wanted sugar and something sweet every night and I had- were the times that I was participating in some sort of rule-based exactly. food eating. And I, and I just drive. now made that connection. <laughs> and our bodies are really hardwired against weight loss. Like it's really hard to stay in a calorie deficit because our body wants to be in that set point range. Like it doesn't really want to shift. So even if we miss a meal or a snack or we undereat, you know, a few days ago, we might still experience an urge to overeat as long as a few days later, because our body remembers, like it knows that there was that energy deficit there. So it's, it's very difficult. Our bodies are really smart. And yeah, that just allowing yourself to have the foods that you crave when you're getting enough energy in total, it's, is really what helps. Um, but if we are in an energy deficit, then the cravings, the cravings are going to be stronger. Um, one more thing I want to mention about that is that a lot of people feel really frustrated with intuitive eating. Like they start trying to eat intuitively and they're just eating everything or they're binge eating and they just feel really dis- discouraged and feel like intuitive eating doesn't work for me. And I just want to acknowledge that that it's a process. And if there is someone who is has a history of disordered eating or like these unbalanced eating patterns, it is a bit of a process to shift into intuitive eating. Intuitive eating is like an end goal for anyone, especially with an eating disorder. Their, their eating habits have to be regulated before they can transition into intuitive eating. But um, for a lot of us, yeah, just eating all the food groups, meeting our energy needs and giving into our cravings really helps alleviate those intense urges. Well, I feel like that's a perfect <laughs> note to end this episode on. I was going to say I'm you're... hungry right now. So <laughs> know, I'm actually my body ready for is lunch. like you need some food. Yes. <laughs> you need to listen to Natalie and go that. eat some food. <laughs> Well, we are so grateful, Natalie. I think you gave such really valuable information to our community today. And I hope that as we continue to dissect some of these, um, you know, expectations and toxic weight loss messages and, you know, cultural values that we don't have to subscribe to anymore, I think that we can all really benefit from being able to have the freedom that you're offering with food is such a gift. So thank you so much for joining us and let us, let us know so and let our community know where they can find you at on social media rose. or your website. So you can find me on Instagram and on TikTok at wake up and smell the rose. And my website is wake up and smell the rose.com. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> Love that handle. It's a good one. <laughs> Thank you so much for having Thank me. You Thank so you much, so much, Natalie. Natalie. We're really grateful that you were us. here. <laughs>